Um, I'd like to say thank you for being invited, first of all, and um, for the team for, for setting this session up. It's really exciting, and it's really exciting to have these people in the same room. It doesn't happen a lot, especially with research and experimental game making. that tends to happen often on a shoestring, often by individuals that are working very hard themselves um, to try and make games kind of more or less out of nothing. Um, so it's really great to actually be able to put people together. So um, my name's Dan Pinchbeck. I'm a reader in computer games at the University of Portsmouth, which is the kind of the very strange UK version of assistant professor. Um, and I'm also creative director of a studio called The Chinese Room. Um, what I want to talk about is, is really how, in a lot of ways, I ended up being the director of an independent studio. Um, which came very much from a research point and how the games we've made have been driven by a research agenda and really showing, I think, the opportunities for radical game design that can be very, very effective, successful game design when it's drawn from a research basis. So the fact that by coming from this very particular position of starting with a, a, a research exploration, you discover... Uh, places to design which you wouldn't necessarily get if you hadn't have come from that journey. Um, in particular for us, that's ended up being uh, very successful with the, the game that we're due to release in, in January called Dear Esther. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the research basis, how that led us to the point of actually building games, very quickly talk about a couple of the, the first mod games that we made, and then talk a bit about um, Dear Esther itself, how it works, how it's different, and how that feeds in and kind of completes the journey that we started um, from research. I'm also using two computers because I have the notes on one and the slideshow on another. So I'm kind of going to be doing this, and uh, bear with me if that doesn't work as well as it ought to. Um, so um, I started off uh, doing a doctorate in first-person shooters, which is still amazing when you tell people. They say, oh, you're a doctor, and what in? I'm like, well, I'm in first-person shooters, and they kind of look at you slightly strangely and say they really will let you do a doctorate in anything now. Um, but it was driven by this idea of saying... We have an awful lot of games. We have a, a huge amount of games on the planet at the moment. And we have this strange situation in games research where we really don't know very much about them. We have practically no large bodies of data about these games. We don't know what average games look like. We don't know what a typical game looks like. We can only work on our kind of understanding as players and developers. But as far as actual academic data goes, really simple questions like saying, what is an average first-person shooter? What is a, a prototypical first-person shooter? We simply don't have that information. Why do we find the types of NPCs we do? Why do we find the types of configuration that we do? Is this because this is the only way to make these products work, or is it simply because of the way historically they've developed through the market? As both a as a researcher and as a game designer, these are hugely important questions because we want to try and find out where the edges of design are, where are the new opportunities for innovation and everything else. And this is where research really ought to be playing a very significant role because, excuse me just one second, um, because it allows us to try and work those things out in a way that the games industry, there's, when you're under a lot of pressure developing, you, you have large kind of time constraints and financial constraints, you don't necessarily have the time to explore these things. But as researchers, we can do that. But as I was working through the, the early part of the PhD, um, it really kind of struck me that, that actually we don't have this amount of data and it's very difficult to talk about, for example, first-person shooters without being able to say, well, what is one? What does it look like? Without talking in high-level theory, how do we say, this is how we can describe this type of game because this is what these types of games as a body have, um, have given us in terms of development. So I spent four years playing a huge amount of first-person shooters. I played, um, I looked at 34 major games over a 10-year period from 1998 to 2008. I played each game three times, which is a huge amount of work and was immensely depressing in places because some of those games shouldn't even be played through once, let alone three times. And did, a, in, in kind of academic terms, a structural analysis of the content. I was particularly interested in how redundant I felt the, the, the debate was about the relationship between gameplay and story or diegetic content, that somehow the integers within a game were distinct and separate from the more representational elements. And for me, they're not. And I was, I was sure that actually, when you took aside a lot of the academic debate about whether games should be seen as stories or should be seen as rule systems, actually there was something much more interesting going on um, particularly how story was used to influence player behaviour and to define an experience. 
that actually it was a, a gameplay technique in itself. Um, and so the basic idea behind the PhD was to try and look at that, to try and see how story actually could be seen as uh, the same thing of an ammo counter or a, a damage modifier or things like that. Um, in reality, what it came down to a lot of it was uh, this idea of uh, just simply counting barrels, of just looking at a game and saying, how many NPCs are there in the game? What do the NPCs do? How do the NPCs behave? How do they act? And creating a large body of baseline data that even then, if the argument of the PhD proved to be redundant or was overthrown or didn't work, at the very least, we'd have that amount of information where we could look at a genre of games and say, we know what this looks like and we have the raw data we can draw our conclusions from. Um, and actually, this, this, this generates some, some really interesting ideas that are not necessarily intuitively graspable if you're not looking at it from that point of view of, of generating raw data. And what I want to do quickly is run through some of those ideas that came out of it, and that sort of sets the scene for then the jumping-off point for actually designing and developing games themselves, and, and hopefully you'll see why as we go through, we've ended up making the types of games we have. So, for example, we looked at things like cataloguing the types of worlds that are presented in games and saying, how far in the future are they set? What kind of technologies do they present? Do they show any different kind of altered physics or magic? Do they include monsters or aliens? Do they include um, enemy agents that are drawn from uh, the real world? And it was fairly easy to break down games into four kind of classes of, of reality they present. So you have things like a normal reality where uh, a game like, say, um, uh, Wolfenstein is, is, is set in the Second World War very historically when you start off. You have no indication at the beginning of the game anything strange is going to happen. Or Prey, you start off in a bar in contemporary America on a Native American um, uh, encampment. Very, very quickly, all of these games move you away from normality, that the first thing that happens in a game is normality breaks down and you are pushed to something where they introduce uh, fantastical elements. But then this widens out and then you have this idea of extended realities where they're basically like normal reality, only one thing has been changed, which is a kind of really classic cinematic technique. So in a game like uh, Fear, um, it's set in contemporary America with the one change that the US has developed psychic super soldiers. So... These kind of raise questions of why these games operate the way they do. Why change reality in those ways? Why start in reality if you're going to become fantastic? And what we're kind of interested in is, is looking at all of these elements of story and world and all those representational parts of design are all tools for training the player to behave in a certain way, think, feel, experience and interpret in a certain way. When you place the player in a real world setting, you communicate very explicitly to them you can expect to apply real-world rules to this space. You can expect to see physics operate in the way in which you know it should. You can expect that the human characters you're looking at are likely to behave and emotionally relate to each other in a way in which you can draw on your knowledge of the world and your knowledge of past media. But very quickly then, you introduce these elements, these fantastic elements, and go, but, there's a but here. Actually, this world isn't real. Actually, there is something fantastic happening. So we've established this baseline of how the world works, but now as a designer, we now have the power to say, but you have to follow our rules. You can't question us. It's kind of like the real world, only there's an alien spaceship with different technologies. So when, when things start happening that don't fit the real world, you can trust us with that. But again, it's all about this idea of training the player. We then can go on from that and actually start classifying um, uh, many types of things that happen in these worlds. And you can look at things like how the different levels um, relate to each other. And one of the things that, that happens in first-person shooters is they break down into two groups very, very distinctly that um, we ended up calling bridging games and distributed games. And in a bridging game, you move geographically through a single world that when you end a level and you enter a new level, it's joined. So you leave the offices and you enter a corridor and then you go into the warehouse. But there's a reality to how that works. And this is very different from games like Deus Ex, um, or Halo, where in between the levels you abruptly move from one location to another. You go from New York to Shanghai. Actually, these types of games, are, they're, they're much fewer. And there's a question there of why. Is that just a, a, a way in which games have historically developed being made? Or what are the advantages of using that kind of bridging structure? And there's all sorts of things that then, when you start thinking about it, come out of that. With a bridging structure, you can always see the final destination of where you're going. So you can represent on screen to the player very often, this is where the game is going to end. 
And Half-Life 2 is the classic example of this. When you start the game and you see the enemy citadel far off in the distance, and constantly through the game it returns you to a skyline as the citadel gets closer and closer and closer. So it's not just about the story. That's communicating directly to the player and saying, this is how far through the game you are. You are now about 50% of the way through because it's about 50% bigger. And when you're standing at the door of the citadel, you know that you're going into the end game, which is a really important thing to signal to a player because if you don't want players to get bored or turn the game off or anything, you need to tell them constantly, this is where you are. And it allows you to do things like that. Um, the majority of games are monodirectional. When you leave a level, you can't return to it. And bridging structures work particularly effectively with that because you're on a journey all the way through. There's no idea that you might want to return. And you find returns much more commonly in distributed games where if you're hopping around the globe as you do in Deus Ex, it's okay to go back to New York because you're not on a journey through New York where that environment is developing. You go back and everything's changed. So the way in which that representational design is working is having a very real absolute effect on the type of training the player has about what to expect from the gameplay. And you can see this in a simpler way in things like the number of weapons you have access to. Um, as you increase the number of weapons, you increase the likelihood that actually what you're going to have is a game that limits the number of weapons you have access to at any given point by an inventory system. They tend to be more like role-playing games. They tend to be more configurative. It's a very different type of play. Games with smaller number of weapons tend to be those that are kind of populously called run and gun, where you have a constantly ramping set of rewards. When you're given a new gun, you can do new things with it. It's another way of indicating to the player you have moved through the game. Um, and those games which don't use that kind of reward system tend to reward you by configuring your inventory correctly. So even something as simple as that, when you start counting those things, they start you start seeing objectively how gameplay is being described and trained in the player, but you're not having to recourse to say, this feels like the type of game where it's a run-and-gun shooter, you're in corridors, you've got this constant threat. You can objectively say, this is this type of game, without having to interpret it, um, because we're just simply looking at, at, at numbers, which is not a complete and an absolute way of looking at games, but it's a, an incredibly useful, powerful way of doing it. And then you can extend this really interestingly into story itself. And one of the processes that we went through is trying to map plots of these games onto a standard dramatic Freytag's triangle. So you have the usual things of uh, rising action, climaxes, crisis points, falling actions. And two interesting things come out of this. One is that only about half first-person shooter games actually fit this model neatly. The rest just don't. They don't fit that, that kind of model. And that's really interesting in terms of the kind of rhetoric around game writing that floats around of saying, we need a hero's journey. This is seen as now we import this from Hollywood. You have a hero's journey. It's a standard established model, and it works. But actually, it's not what happens. There are really critical points in a hero's journey that are more or less always missing from first-person games. And as a researcher, as an analysis, that's interesting to me because you start saying, well, then... We shouldn't be importing these models from other media. We should be saying, why do we find what we do within this particular thing? They must have some function that means that most of the plots and stories we find in first-person shooters conform to their own model, because that what works for the medium, rather than saying we have to try and twist the strengths of this medium to fit another medium. Um, and there are some things in there also which come out which you then start seeing all games doing. You start looking at the synchronization between story events and gameplay shifts. Um, only a limited number of games at the point of climax, which is a critical point in any story arc, synchronize this with a gameplay event of any kind. The classic example is Bioshock. Halfway through the game, you find the man you've been sent to kill and he tells you that actually you've been duped and you've been lied to and your entire journey up until that point has not been yours. Um, and this is quite a common thing, but it rarely synchronises with anything particularly going on in gameplay. Quite often in games, the climax of the story doesn't occur with, with, with any kind of shift in what's going on. On the other hand, you have a thing which um, we ended up calling the radical break, which usually happens at the kind of the denouement, the actual point where the game, the story moves into its kind of end point, where you usually do change gameplay significantly. Like in Half-Life, when you reach the Citadel, your gameplay changes, the type of weapons you have access to change radically. In Bioshock, you actually become one of the core enemies you've been fighting all the way through. You become a big daddy. Um, in the original Half-Life, you go to an alien world and gravity changes, so the whole gameplay shifts. And so there's a question about that, because if you don't need require a synchronized gameplay event with the pot climax, why do you have a synchronized gameplay event 
when you go into the end game. And then when you think about it in those terms, it, it becomes, again, very, very simple. That you're communicating to the player, literally, there's not long now. It's okay. If you've been plugging through this thing for 30 hours, don't worry, you're nearly there. And it's kind of a way of reassuring them and rewarding them. And also of making what's effectively the same gameplay that they've had for the last 30 hours um, reinvented and reinvigorated and more interesting whilst only actually investing a very small amount of resources. So one of the things that kind of came out of this was looking at how story basically allows developers to make players think and accept, and this is not saying that they're fooling players, I really believe there's a contract between designer and player where the designer says, if you accept what I'm presenting you, I will give you a good experience. You have to suspend your disbelief a little. You have to go with the flow of what I'm presenting. But if you do that, then you get a good experience from it. But one of the ways you can do this with story is you can effectively bolt different representations and different interpretations of the action onto effectively exactly the same gameplay. And when we looked at game plots, actually what we found is you can reduce them to a, a relatively small number of types of plot event where you generally have to locate something or go to a location or it relates to an object that you have to destroy or protect or find or it relates to an agent that you have to follow or kill or protect. And this can either happen in one location or you can have to travel somewhere to a static target and do it or you can have to travel with that object. And you can break these down. And actually, when you look at these things, when you're saying, OK, well, if we take an object, so the standard gameplay thing, you have to go somewhere, and it's going to relate to object A. Um, you can basically have exactly the same gameplay. You have to basically fight your way through, shoot hundreds of people, and then at the end of it, there's a button, and you press the button. And really, basically, that's an FPS. And that's the majority of FPS is for since Doom, which is now coming up on you know, nearly 20 years. But if you say, when you press this button, you blow up an ammo dump. The player interprets that differently from if you say, if you press this button, you start a surgical machine which saves someone's life. There's a different emotional response to that. But without changing anything about any of the integer-based gameplay, you let the player interpret emotionally what's going on in a different way, and you diversify the gameplay experience. So this kind of suggests that what you're doing with story, as, as kind of should be self-obvious, really, is you are manipulating and you are um, controlling and you are working with player expectation, player interpretation, player emotional response. Now, if you're doing that, you're orchestrating an experience. And if you're orchestrating that experience, I don't see any conceptual difference between orchestrating an experience on that level and orchestrating an experience by saying, this is the number of guns you have access to. This is how many points you get on your health if you pick up a health pack. You're still controlling and identifying and, with the player, creating this experience which has these boundaries and these rules. So for me, that kind of came out as being, well, OK, then we can see story as basically conceptually belonging to the same thing as things like ammo counters and depreciating health values and uh, the way in which a, a, a hardwired finite state AI might work. It's really the same thing. It's all about working towards this orchestrated experience. This left a lot of unanswered questions, though. It answered the, the kind of things like this, of saying, well, if that's true, can we remove those kind of hard, integer gameplay things? Can we remove enemy agents? Can we remove gunplay? Because if we're talking about defining an experience and engaging experience, can you just use story to do that? Is that enough? Or if we understand that plot is one way that a player can interpret the events that are going on and can put their actions into context and give them meaning, what about if the story makes absolutely no sense whatsoever? If it's nonsensical, what happens at that point? Will players accept it? Or the basic model of a first-person shooter, of any first-person shooter, and of an awful lot of games is you start a comp with a complex environment, and you move through that complex environment, removing agents by killing them, removing interaction by pressing buttons and picking up health kits. And generally what happens is when you've reduced that environment to its most simplest form, you then move on to another complex environment and go through exactly the same process of simplifying it again. So what happens if you flip that on its head? What if you have an environment that becomes more complex as you go through it? Can you still have the same type of experiential feel to gameplay? And there's no way of getting at these questions because the products don't exist in the marketplace that let you answer them. They simply aren't there. But these are important questions. And they also start suggesting areas of design of saying, well, if these things are true, if there's strength in these, and the market and the industry currently isn't doing it, is there an opportunity for game designers and game developers to expand the kind of uh, vocabulary of first-person games to produce different things that have different experiences? 
and both from a research point of view and from a very brutal kind of economic, industrial point of view, those are really, really good questions. How do you answer them? Enter the Chinese room. What we basically did was we went out to uh, a research council in the UK and we said, look, we've got these great questions about games that we've come out with following this research theoretical model. We can't answer them now. All we can do is guess or make high-level theory. That's not good enough. And it's definitely not good enough for industry and for players, even if it's good enough for academics, because you can... There's so many things in the world that are theoretically possible but are practically impossible. And if you're actually working in the games industry, you have no interest in theoretical possibilities because you go bankrupt and you need to actually be producing things which will allow your business to develop and to carry on and innovating. So we said, give us some money, we'll put a team together and we'll make some uh, game mods. So game mods are um, freely distributed add-ons to games. Most first-person shooters now ship with access to the build tools for those games and the community are allowed to use those build tools to create new game experiences and to share them freely over the internet provided they don't charge for them. And it's a really wonderful, huge established community where there's already a great amount of innovation going on. So we built uh, three mods initially to explore these different questions. And the idea behind it was the core kind of principles for me were it forced us to think like developers. So it meant that when we were speaking to developers, we weren't speaking to developers as academics. We could say, we're doing this. We understand we're in the same position as you. We're having to make the compromises you are. We're having to operate under the constraints you are. We've seen the opportunities you are. And we're having to deal with code, not theory. Um, it enabled us to create these experiences and put them out in the public domain as games. So when we were floating them out on the internet into the mod community, the people that were playing them didn't care about any of the theory. They weren't interested in the experimentation. They wanted to know if they were going to have a good experience with this piece of media, which meant when they came back and talked to us about that experience, it was honest, it had a validity, because it wasn't people sitting in a room. And they come back and say, your game absolutely sucks because of X, Y, and Z. We'd know that that was someone talking to us as a player rather than someone who felt like they were kind of engaging in a research project. And it also meant if they liked it, they liked it because it was a good game. And then we could say, this theoretical idea works, and we know it works as a game, not just as a research idea. Um, it makes the research aspect, when you introduce it, very, very easy to grasp for those people as well, where you can say, actually, no, this is academic research. And suddenly, we were starting to talk to major studios, who previously, historically, have a very, very uh, deeply antagonistic relationship with academics. Because, like, yeah, you go off there, and you, do, you write your little theory, and you do all that stuff, and we'll actually make games. And we can go back and go, no, we've made a game. And you can play it and you can play our ideas. And when we say you can have a game which is a successful experience, which is just pure story, we can tell you it works and you can play it for yourself and find out if it works and make that decision. And that puts you in a position of enormous strength talking to developers. I think it makes you relevant. I think it makes you honest. And I think those are really important things. So I'm going to very, very quickly talk about two of those and then go on to Dear Esther, which is the, the kind of most significant game we've done, and explain how that kind of factors into the research. Um, this is quite dark, so hopefully it will be able to see. This is a game called Conscientious Objector, which was a, a mod of Doom 3, um, which is obviously infamous kind of bloody running gun shooter. And in this, we were interested in this idea of environments becoming more complex, not less complex. Um, and we did something very, very simple. We recoded, we hacked the game and we replaced the uh, bullets in the shotgun with rubber bullets and we changed the animations on the zombies so if you shot a zombie it would fall down and get knocked out of the way but then it would just get straight back up again and keep coming at you so as you went through the environment it wasn't a case of removing, it didn't get simpler, you didn't get rid of these zombies more and more and more of them started appearing and they slowly follow you around this environment and box you in um, and while we were doing this we were also interested in the idea of, of NPCs every NPC, every core NPC in a game is your friend and they're there to explain what's going on with the game, to help you work your way around the game to understand what's going on. And we said, well, that's fine, okay, that's, that's, that's good. But they can do that whilst being really unpleasant to you. Is there any particular reason why they have to be nice to you? So we rewrote an NPC who was just foul and horrible to the player and criticises literally everything you do. If you shoot a zombie, he says, well, that was useless, what are you going to do next? If a zombie hits you, he calls you an idiot. And he's really openly, deeply abusive to you. Um, and we had a lot of uh, kind of more... Uh, political things going on about unionisation and corporatisation as well going on in the kind of audio logs you find around. And we just kind of wanted to see how players responded to this and whether it was a kind of a good experience. And what was really interesting is that players loved this NPC. They thought he was great. He really made them laugh, even though he was horrible. And they couldn't, get their, couldn't quite believe the fact that they were just getting abuse constantly by the game. But they kind of liked it. 
which is really interesting because that breaks a complete rule of NPC design where they're supposed to say, you're doing really well, come on, let's get to the next level, let's make this happen. You're a hero and instead you've got someone saying, you know, I really hope you die on this level because you've played really badly so far. Um, which is great, which is a little kind of thing that you can go back to industry and say, you know, you don't have to have these standard models of NPCs. Um, the kind of rubber bullet thing worked really well as well. Players got completely freaked out by it because they were suddenly going, it doesn't work, it doesn't, this game doesn't do what it's supposed to do and I have to think differently and actually it gets more and more and more difficult. Um, and it's incredibly nihilistic, a lot of them found. And, but they were writing back and saying, it's really nice to have such a bleak experience, but it still plays like Doom. You still get all the action, all the franticness, all the kind of like the blasts and the zombies and everything else, but there's a different emotional tone to it. It didn't do so well in other respects. We got about 1,500 downloads, which is not great for a game, and partially because the engine is, is not something which is modded particularly frequently. So we wanted to look at doing something which had a slightly bigger kind of access to, to a bigger player base. And so we left that and we moved on to um, a, a mod called Corsacovia, which is where we really wanted to look at this idea of can we have a game that just doesn't make sense. So it sets itself up broadly as being a psychological survival horror, but the story makes no sense. It's completely contradictory. You play a character who's insane, um, who has delusions, who sees things, who hears things. You have no idea if what's happening to you in the game is real. Um, we had environments that just fractured into each other so you'd leave a room in a hospital and find yourself in a warehouse and there were objects spinning around in the air for no reason. And we were also interested in this idea that all creatures in games are usually anthropomorphized. They look in some way like a human being and this helps you understand what they're doing. You can see their motive. If an enemy soldier is trying to kill you, you can go, the enemy soldier is trying to kill me because he's my enemy or we're fighting over the same things or it's a demon from hell so of course it wants to rip my head off. And these are standard kind of design tools that designers use to control it. Well, what if you have creatures that are just big black balls of smoke or heat hazes and they obviously want to kill you but you have no idea why and you can't predict their behavior because you don't know which direction they're facing in. You don't know if they're in threat mode, you don't know if they've seen you. Let's just confuse players kind of utterly and, and see what happens with it. Hello, this Christopher. This is the trailer for it. How are you this evening? So Corsacovia was absolutely horrible to play for that reason, that we, had, we, we did things like random, incredibly loud bursts of static and white noise for no reason. We had strobe effects going off for no reason. We had doors that unlocked and locked themselves randomly when a player went near them. Incredibly confusing environments, slanting environments on their side, so you kind of had to run at an angle to try and induce stuff like uh, simulator sickness and motion sickness, and to just throw as much of this stuff as the player as we could and say, if we design a game which is a terrible game, can we still hook players with it? Um, in which case, can you kind of go way further than any industrial kind of like innovation would because we're breaking rules and then kind of come backwards to something that's a, a medium and kind of uh, try and find spaces where you can push beyond what's acceptable. Um, it kind of didn't work. Um, we made some really bad design choices in it, some really uh, just kind of game design 101 screw-ups. Um, that caused us some big problems because players were coming in and go, see, I really like the game and I really wanted to like it, but that was just horrible. And we had to look at it and go, that wasn't intentional. And our, our kind of like intentional experimentations got mangled with um, just me making some really, really horrible design choices. But what we did find was that, um, particularly with the story, players' um, tolerance of ambiguity and abstraction and contradiction and just nonsensical kind of things was way, way, way higher than you get in traditional games. Players were really hungry for it. They loved it. And there were a lot of people coming back and saying, I was very, I'm bored with survival horrors because you just predict it all the time. You know what's going to happen. Suddenly I was in a space where I had no idea what was happening next and I completely freaked out. Um, and there's some great kind of YouTube stuff online of people screaming into microphones when things happen. It's going, ah, I can't know what's going on there. And what was really kind of interesting in Corsicavia as well is that a, a Around the same time as we were developing Corsicovia, 
uh, there's a, a studio called Frictional Games based in Sweden who are developing a game called Amnesia, The Dark Descent, that basically did everything we wanted to do in Corsicovia, but did it properly. And so we'd kind of released Corsicovia just before... Um, uh, amnesia came out and we're going okay or oh, we don't know if we've gone too far some of these things don't work and suddenly amnesia hits and amnesia sold half a million units with nothing but word of mouth press and has won more awards than than anything else and people are going this is the reinvention of survival horror and we got started talking to frictional and, and they were saying yeah no it's actually we were really on similar paths it's just basically they did it right and we kind of did it wrong but even though Corsicovia didn't work fully for us, the proof was there again to go out to industry and say, you can break these rules. It's okay. There are these really great design spaces just over the horizon of where you're working. And not only will this work as a designer, but what kind of amnesia proved is you can make a lot of money off this. Innovation really can, can you know, make a, a, a decent living for you. Um, so anyway, I want to spend the, the last bit of it talking about the um, uh, Dear Esther, which is kind of our what was originally most successful mod and is now about to be released as a, as a fully realized independent game. Um, and this was a runaway success for us. I'll talk a bit about that in a, in a bit. But it was, this was unexpected. It completely caught me by surprise how well this did. Um, effectively, in gameplay, we looked at this idea of saying, OK, story is a gameplay device because story orchestrates the experience in the same way that integer-based gameplay devices orchestrate an experience. Let's get rid of anything remotely resembling traditional gameplay and just present a story in a world and see whether that's enough for players. Um, and then because I kind of never take the easy road, we then said, well, then what happens then if we also make the story semi-randomized and we make the story very abstract, very poetic, very ambiguous, so it resists any one interpretation. So you don't really quite know what's going on. It's got a very unreliable narrator. Huge bits of it don't make sense again. But rather than Corsicovia's very frantic, panicky tone, it's much slower and calmer and more tragic and meditative. Will that work? So we, we built it, and we effectively built this, this island and told a story about a man who might or might not have been in a car crash, who might or might not be having some kind of coma dream, who's had this kind of traumatic, tragic experience with this woman called Esther, but you don't really know who she is or what relation he is to her. Um, the whole island, the whole situation might be imaginary or it might be completely literal, and we're not going to answer any of those questions. And effectively, what we asked the player to do was to walk around this island. And as they did, they triggered voiceovers, and every time they triggered a voiceover, it was randomly generated. Um, so I'm just going to play you... Oops, I didn't intend that to happen. Um, uh, play you a, a, a brief excerpt of this, and I'll talk about it in a bit more detail. It might need a bit more volume. Donnelly's book had not been taken out from the library since 1974. I decided it would never be missed as I slipped it under my coat and avoided the librarian's gaze on the way out. If the subject matter is obscure, the writer's literary style is even more so. It is not the text of a stable or trustworthy reporter. It's very quiet. Um, I'll talk about the voiceovers in a, in, a, in a minute, actually, so I can, I can speak over this as it goes. So effectively, this is the game for about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, you move around the island, and nothing happens. Um, there's no agents, there's no animation. All that happens is occasionally you fire a piece of music, and as you move it around, you fire these voiceovers, and this narrator, there's only one character, reads out these fragments of what initially seem to be fragments of letters, but then he starts talking to you directly, and it gets very kind of... Uh, I guess quite confused and, and, and kind, of, kind of all starts collapsing in on itself. Um, and we kind of put it out there, and this is, a, this is the rebuild. The original build was, was, was pretty crude. Um, it was, we weren't very good source models at this point. We didn't really know the engine very well, and we kind of just put together this very, very basic landscape. And we kind of thought, well, we'll kind of see what happens, and, and you know, we'll put it out there, and maybe we'll get a couple of hundred downloads, and then we can analyze the response to that and see where we are from it. And... Um, Actually, that's not what happened. Within a month, it had had 15,000 downloads. And then with another couple of months, we started winning awards for it. And then the downloads just started going up and up and up. And we realized, actually, we were sitting on something that appeared to be something of a cult hit. And we spent time trying to say, well, why? Why has this thing resonated so much with gamers? And these are not casual gamers. These are hardcore first-person shooter players. Because the mod scene, the people that play mods are usually people that are obsessed with first-person shooters. So they have a steady diet of slaughter. And they're absolutely leaping on this and lapping it up. 
Um, and that was amazing. And that was a really interesting point where, again, we suddenly found ourselves starting to talk to studios who were going, okay, how can we do this? How can we get a bit of this? Because you've done something which should not work for this audience. Absolutely should not work. And yet it's getting hundreds. It's now up at over 100,000 downloads. So that's a really good response for a, a tiny little niche thing. Um, so we started um, to kind of look at sort of analyzing what's going on a bit more with it and, and, and why we think it might be working, how it relates back to that kind of that research process. So I just want to talk about the design a little bit and, and, and how it's kind of different. Um, and then we'll come back to that a bit. So okay, the idea is, is that you, um, you have this environment and you have invisible tripwires. And for every one single time you hit an invisible tripwire, it fires a voiceover. But the voiceover is being drawn from a bank. Every single tripwire has four voiceovers attached to it. And you don't know which voiceover you're going to get. And depending on which voiceover you get, you can have a whole bunch of different interpretations of the story. Like for some voiceovers suggest more strongly that the island is imaginary. Um, other voiceovers suggest more uh, a literal interpretation of what's going on. Some of the voiceovers position Esther as a kind of a, a, a wife or a partner. Some of them uh, suggest that she might be some other kind of family member. There's a very limited number of combinations that if you get in the story suggests that rather than being the victim of a crash, that the narrator caused the crash. You don't know whether the person who caused the crash did so because they had a heart attack or because they were drunk driving. And, you never know, and we don't know as, a, as writers, as developers, what story the player is going to have as well, which is really exciting. So, for example, uh, where's my mouse gone? You might get from here this last time. I have understood there is no turning back. The torch is failing along with my resolve. I can hear the singing of the sea creatures from the passages above me, and they are promising the return of the gulls. Or you might get. Did Jacobson crawl this far? Can I identify the scratches his nails ruined into the rocks? Am I following him cell for cell, inch for inch? Why did he turn back on himself and not carry through to the ascent? So Jacobson is a is a on the island. The um, uh, the narrator has found the history of a shepherd who went there and caught a disease and died, and then the island was shunned because of it, and then. As we go on past that point where it's very, very kind of literal, then you start getting the suggestion that actually Jakobsen is a kind of a mythical figure, that he's a, um, a reincarnation of a hermit who came to the island before and that the narrator might be the latest reincarnation of this hermit figure. But only if you get those combination of voiceovers. Otherwise, Jakobsen remains completely historical and linear and you never make that connection. Um, Donnelly did not pass through the Donnelly's game. another character. From here on in, his guidance, unreliable as it is, is gone from me. I understand now that it is between the two of us and whatever correspondence can be drawn from the wet rocks. When we introduce Donnelly, initially Donnelly is a, um, an 18th century map maker who comes to the island and stays on it for a while. But then again, depending on the combination of things you get, Donnelly either becomes like a mystic or everything becomes a result of the fact that he's a lord and a maddict and the characters start collapsing. And I think what was kind of really interesting about this for us was um, that... It wasn't just about the experience for players. That Because we didn't signal any of this kind of stuff, players would play through it, and then they'd go back and play it again and suddenly find themselves confronted with a completely different story. And they'd have to completely rethink everything they'd gone through. And they just loved it. And the forums just exploded with people sharing kind of ideas and interpretations and coming back to me and saying, we demand you tell us what the correct answer, what's the solution to this? And this idea that people were hungry for a solution, and there is no solution. We wrote it deliberately, so there is no single interpretation or reading. You can't, and I spent a long time balancing it, so no one particular interpretation could be taken as more powerful. And then people started saying, I know it's obviously this. This is clearly what's going on. And inventing whole new stories that aren't in the game about trying to interpret what was going on. And I had a wonderful moment where someone had... Um, I was looking at a, a, a forum, I think it was on uh, ModDB, which is the, the big mod um, community site, and someone had put this, this amazingly complex, convoluted interpretation of, of what the story was. And they'd made an error on something, and I wrote back and, and sort of anonymously and just said, you know, it couldn't be that really because this and this happens. And they wrote and said, you just clearly haven't obviously played this game, which is a, a really lovely moment as a developer to be kind of corrected by your own players. Um, we also, in, in the remake, then moved on and did a lot of stuff with... Um, uh, very small environmental details. The other thing we wanted to do was to, to look at the way in which assets are used in games, that usually if you're a developer, you have to make the most of all your assets. Every asset has a cost to it. So you absolutely make sure every player sees every asset you build. It's really important. That's oh, not me. That's going on from there. Um, 
So we were really interested in this idea of rewarding players with, with, with assets that were very subtle and very easy to miss. Um, as this idea of trying to slow the player down, of saying you are rewarded for being very slow, for being very attentive to this world, anything to stop people trying to run or bunny hop through it. So we introduced for the remake lots and lots of new, very kind of uh, abstract, very odd things that you had to really pay attention to. And this was coming back to this kind of idea of, um, of looking at how you use those story elements or those representational elements to train the player to behave in a certain way. If you try and play Dear Esther like you play a standard FPS, i.e. run as fast as you can from cover to cover and try and click things, you're going to have a really, really poor experience. If you play it very slowly and you spend time stopping and looking at things and really listening to the story, the more you put into it in that way, the more you get out. And... When we went round to, to redevelop from the 2007 mod to the 2011 game, we were really conscious of saying, how do we try and make sure that every player is encouraged to do that? And one of the ways we looked at doing it was this idea of very small visual elements that are also randomly generated. So sometimes they'll be there and sometimes they won't. They'll always be highly ambiguous like the story. And if you really focus on those, they relate in a kind of quite disjointed way to what's going on in the stories. So we have, towards the end of the game, a series of very strange shrines where we have candles and car parts and photographs and um, hospital equipment or um, symbols. There's a lot of symbols and, and writing painted onto the rock in Esther. So when you uh, reach the final level, the, 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 the narrator, whoever he is, has, has written... Um, he considers, he starts thinking that the man who might and what have called the crash is called Paul, who might and what the narrator, and the the story starts suggesting that he is the biblical figure, Paul. So we have all this biblical text painted in huge letters all over the cliff. And then we kind of expanded that to do things like having chemical diagrams with Hebrew letters on them and things like that, where if you look at them, you can either glance at them and move on and have this very kind of superficial experience, or if you start saying, but why? why what is that a chemical diagram for? And how does that relate to kind of like, why is it going into an electrical symbol? And what do the numbers mean in Hebrew? And the, the numbers for 21, which is uh, the kind of conspiracy theory thing of the weight of the soul. Um, and there's a lot of uh, references to 21 in the text, where there's 21 gulls land on the side of the motorway after the crash, and there's 21 paper boats in the sea for no reason. Um, but none of these things are designed to make sense. None of them are... It's, the way we kind of looked at it was saying, we don't require plot in most of the other media forms on the planet. We don't look at a painting and require it to have a narrative. We don't look at a Jackson Pollock and try and work out where the first squiggle was and where the last squiggle was. We accept it as a poetic vision and it has a mood and an emotional tone. And we also find that, ironically, in casual games, in games like Angry Birds or um, Pong, you don't go, where's the beginning and the end of this experience? You just soak up the experience for the, for the mood it creates in you. Why can't we do that with more complex dietic games? And really with Esther, when we were talking about it with people afterwards and people would say, but what's the answer? The point is not whether you understand it or not. I don't care whether people understand it or not. I'm not interested in that at all. I'm interested in whether people have a, an emotional reaction to it. You can, I mean, we, it's now being translated into about 14 different languages. But the fact that it's, we have people that want to translate it into those languages, we also have lots of players where English is you know, not their first language and they don't even speak particularly good English, who have come back and said, I really loved it because of the tone of the voice of over, because of the tone of the music. And that's really important as well. It is kind of like an immersion tank, that it portrays a mood and a feeling and an emotional space, like a Rothko painting or a... Uh, or like a... a, a a kind of a Yeats poem, you don't have to kind of, no, you don't have to follow the footnotes of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland to get something out of The Wasteland. And actually I think you kind of get less out of it if you try and intellectualise the whole process. There's just a beauty in the way the words fall. And we were just trying to sort of have a look at explore that kind of thing in games. And that's really, again, it's, it's kind of going against a real kind of like sacred cow of game design. If the player's kind of stupid and you have to explain everything to them, everything has to be explicit. It really doesn't, and players love that kind of abstraction. Um, I'm kind of aware of time, so I'm going to try and move through the last couple of things. Um, let me skip that. The really, really important thing about it as well was that in order to do that, we really, really invested very, very heavily in music. We worked with a fantastic composer, Jessica Curry, who the one thing which we did steal from cinema, I was really aware that we weren't going to do cinema theft. But the one thing that we did try and take from cinema was this idea of using music to create this emotional landscape, that we had these very beautiful, soft tones of Nigel Carrington, the narrator, but we also had a, a musical journey which just really drew the player in and supported them and made you feel as if you were floating through this space. And I just want to play a bit of it, because I think it really...
this piece of music, this is from the, the rebuilt soundtrack for the commercial game, I think communicates in about 45 seconds of music the emotional tone of the entire game, which is really quite an achievement. I think what's interesting about the music is in a way it's really quietly radical. It's actually one of the most radical things about Dear Esther because music in games is designed to do this emotional manipulation at a low level. So when you move through the space, it goes, you're kind of going away, everything, exploration music, and then something appears and it goes, dum da dum da dum da dum da dum and you go, oh, action, okay, here I go, and then you, you kill it, and then it goes, again. And we really had a soundtrack that, that screams, listen to me. Stop what you're doing, Listen and just immerse yourself in this music. And one of the things we found that does is it stops players. They literally stop moving because they want to listen to the music. And if you stop in a game, you're suddenly in a completely different behavioural and emotional space than you would be normally. So we have this idea of breaking this constancy of stimulation, this frantic movement. And we really found that it actually has created something that has, has, has struck an enormous chord with gamers that it shouldn't do. According to that kind of data, according to the received wisdom, it shouldn't work, and it does. And so when we go back and we say, is a story a gameplay device, blah, 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 is it enough to have no gameplay and just have story? Yes, it is. And we're actually in a position as academics to say that, yes, we'd have trouble with fine print on that. It's very difficult to pick it up. But when people say, yeah, no, well, story is obviously secondary. Gameplay is everything. If you lose the gameplay, you lose the game. Well, okay, we have a, a very crude source mod in 2007, which has pulled 100,000 downloads. We have two international awards. We have a deal with Valve, who make Half-Life, who are one of the biggest um, game developers on the planet. We have funding from a significant investor. We have mass international press. And we have a game that's hit in the market in 2011, which is expected to do extremely well. And that's not blowing my own trumpet. I'm not saying that to say, we've made this amazing thing, aren't we great? What's fantastic is we've made this amazing thing which shouldn't work, and it does, and that's a really interesting thing. And we would never have got to that point in design if we hadn't have followed through that process of research of saying, we can bring together this data to understand better this genre of SPS, of how it operates structurally. Now, where can we just tweak in one direction or another direction? I don't see Dear Esther as being kind of, for all that, a particularly radical game. It just makes a few tweaks to a standard formula. Um, and it kind of seems to work like that, which makes it to me, ironically, um, like Doom. Um, this is uh, Buddy Ducote from Doom. Um, Ducote stands for Dies at Conclusion of This Episode. Um, he's the avatar in Doom. And originally Doom was um, made as almost as a, a kind of an FPS RPG, um, where there was, it was originally a co-op game, um, where you had up to four characters and up to four players playing the four characters, and... There's a, quite a complex plot. Um, all, the, all the different characters had uh, different abilities and skills and attributes. You could do all kinds of stuff. And when id Software actually went into development of it, they basically threw all that stuff out the window because they said, what we're trying to do is create a very, very, very fine-tuned experience. We want to recreate what it's like to play an arcade game on a PC. And anything which slows that down goes. Why Doom is such a classic, brilliant game is because there, is, there isn't an ounce of fat on Doom. Every single thing you see... Every single number that's in that system is all absolutely tuned to create a very, very, very definite, predefined emotional and behavioural template in the player. And Doom sacrifices an awful lot of representational complexity to do that. It says, story? Yeah, no, we just got demons from hell. Everything wants to kill you because they're all demons from hell. So you can't talk to them. You don't worry about their motives. You don't have to understand anything. 
the world is being invaded by hell, so weird things will happen. You can't explain that. You can't explain anything. You have no power. You have one gun. That's it. And you have to get to the end or you will die. Which is kind of, on one hand, people kind of go, that's a really crass, simplistic story. But it's not. As a functional device, it's an absolutely brilliant story. Because it doesn't do anything other than just say to the player, you have one thing to do in this game, and that is all that is expected of you, and you don't have to worry about anything else. You have to run and shoot and run and shoot and run and shoot until the credits roll. So it's a brilliant functional story. Dear Esther is almost identical to Doom, structurally. It's doing the same thing. It's saying we are going to introduce all these different elements and we're going to use them to gradually bring sort of pressure to bear on the player to say, this is the contract. Behave as we want you to behave in this quite small way and we will deliver you a fantastic experience. There's no difference conceptually between those two games, even though they are poles apart in every other way. And I see Dear Esther as being a, a natural child of Doom. And it's really interesting when I talk to people and they say... You know, oh, yeah, so is this because you really hate first-person shooters? No, I love first-person shooters. I'm completely obsessed with them. They're wonderful games. Um, Dear Esther is not something that was made to challenge games or to destabilize or to interrogate or to do any of those things. Dear Esther is a product which is made through a love of games and a love of what they can be. But only through going through that research process do we kind of get there. Um, so... Um, yeah, I think to sort of the really kind of important thing to, to kind of wrap up on is this kind of experimental design, uh, this idea of kind of like whether you call it art games, whether you call it not games, whether you call it experimental game design. It's a mistake to separate these things out from the history of games, and it's a mistake to see them as being a reaction to games. For the most part, for most people, they're an extension of trying to explore the possibilities of what the game design space is. Um, the relationship with academia is really important. Academics have a phenomenal opportunity to do things that professional developers don't because success and failure means something different in a university. We could make a game like Corsacovia and it could flop horribly as a game. Players could hate it. It still told us really interesting things. As a research object, it was a massive success. If we were a business and we made Corsacovia, I wouldn't be sitting here today. I'd be on signing on to benefits somewhere. Or we'd have to have made something else. But we can do those things as a game. And just occasionally you can make an Esther. And then it can fly and have a life in industry as well. And the great thing about Esther now is that hopefully it will start generating money, which will allow us then to make another experimental game from the back of it, which is a actually what we're doing with uh, our new game, which I'm not going to talk about now, called Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. Um, there is an opportunity for us to do that. And there's an opportunity for, for kind of like um, Indian experimental developers as well to work with people in higher education because actually then there's an incredible safety net. There's public funds still available for starters for, for people that are going to say, well, it's okay. We don't require you to make a commercial success. We require you to build on a research process and do something which brings new data to the table. And the thing which... Um, kind of Esther has done um, for me more than anything else is that it's kind of shone a light into the kind of, it sounds really awful, I'm very pretentious saying this, but hopefully you'll get what I mean. We have this nicely illuminated, mapped out landscape of first person gaming. And we now, you know, I have that data now. I can say I understand where when a new game comes out, it positions itself about here. It relates to these games in this way. But outside that is dark. Outside that is uncharted territory. We don't know what works and what doesn't. And the important thing for me with games like Esther and Conscientious Objector and Corsacovia is we're just shining a little light and just letting people just go a little bit further out, providing new data for people to kind of explore from and also providing, hopefully, just a small way of saying to the games industry, you can also do this. We're not saying you should do this. We're not saying you have to do this. We're not saying you're failing to do this. But this also works, and this falls outside the standard model. But there's interesting stuff just off the map that you really could do with taking a look at. Thank you.